Hi, everybody. Pete Sardis for The Lawyer You Know. We are back. We're going to talk about day two of Aiden Fucci's sentencing. And the judge at this point has issued the final ruling. So you're going to hear from me what the actual court's sentence of Aiden Fucci is. I want to take some time and kind of go through what day two was, which is the victim's impact statements of the family. Um, there was also some, uh, some, some friends of Tristan Bailey that spoke, and I want to go through all of the defense uh, witnesses just to give you an understanding about what that presentation to the court was about. It'll be a little bit of a longer video, so just be prepared if that's something that you're interested in. Great. If not, I'm sorry in advance. After that, I am going to talk about the actual sentence and kind of the discussions that the court had with Aiden Fucci and, of course, with the family. And it'll kind of give you some perspective of, of how this process works. But before we do that, let's start with day two. Um, I want to talk for a second about the Bailey family. They call themselves the Bailey Seven. And I give this family an immense amount of credit. And I will tell you, these people have been the most respectful victims family I think I've ever witnessed, especially now that we're in a place where uh, cameras are in every courtroom and follow, you know, follow almost every tragic event so closely. These people have shown solidarity from day one. They always show up to court wearing teal, which was Tristan's favorite color. They've never spoken poorly in public uh, or to the media about anybody, obviously, involved in this case to include the court, the lawyers, anybody. You don't see them, you know, engaging in angry rhetoric outside of the courtroom. I have not witnessed them being anything but ultimately respectful to every person that's been involved in the case. And that's hard uh, because I can't imagine the loss these people have experienced. And to be able to be in the public eye and to be able to function with the clarity and the respect that these people have functioned is truly amazing. I, I give them uh, all, I mean, all the respect these people are due. This carried in to the day two of sentencing victims impact statements. And day two was when the family all had a chance to uh, speak with the court, talk to Aiden Fucci. And I want to go through what the general uh, tone was of their statements. But I will tell you this. I cannot present for you with the quality and with the effectiveness that the Bailey family's statements were live. In order for me to really give you that experience, we're going to link the videos to the family's uh, victim impact statements to the court. You've just got to watch them. Um, these people obviously um, choreographed this sentencing uh, victim's impact statements for a long time. And I don't say that in a bad way. I really mean that as a positive for them. You can tell that they thought about the meaning of Tristan Bailey to their lives collectively. You can tell that they broke up the uh, what they were gonna say to the court to their individual feelings. You can tell that they um, they were respectful of the court's time. You didn't hear a bunch of you know things being said over and over again. Everything was very well put together, extremely articulate, very thought out. So again, watch uh, the individual victims impact statements that I'm attaching. I will never be able to do these people justice by just telling you about them, but I will tell you about them. All of the siblings, except for uh, Sophia, who is the sister of Tristan Bailey that is just one above her. So the one older sister did not speak but Brittany and Alexis Bailey, uh, Tegan, her brother, and both Stacy and Forrest, her mom and dad, did speak along with Jane Sheffield, who is Tristan's maternal grandmother, all made statements to the court. Um, I will tell you that the first thing I kind of want to go through is talk about how this family set this series of victim impact statements up. What they did was they put uh, Brittany on first. And this is Brittany Bailey. She is the second oldest sibling. And I wanted to show you this picture because you see there's a little jar in front of her. And what she did is when she came up to the witness stand to, to present her witness statement, she put this little jar up there and she tells the court that she is putting a teal heart, a glass teal heart for every one 
of Tristan Bailey's stab wounds, 114 teal hearts. And what Alexis did was she took a heart and put it into the jar, plink, and a second one, plink, and a third, and a fourth. And she put every one of these hearts into this jar individually 114 times. That symbolism is just so deep because it gave us all an opportunity to really sit back and, and feel what Tristan Bailey was going through as uh, Aiden Fucci stabbed her 114 times because you had to wait for her to put each one of these individual little glass hearts into this jar. And you realize how much time passed and how horrible this experience must have been for Tristan Bailey. An amazing symbolic gesture. The second thing that they did was each family member, after they gave their individual victim's impact statement to the court, they put in a white stone. And that white stone is, was symbolic of their individual loss, uh, the individual loss that they experienced from Tristan Bailey's murder. Um, after that, some of them spoke to Aiden Fucci, and I'll kind of go through what those comments looked like generally. And um, they talked about their individual loss. And we were talking about a family that came together and talked about openly in the public, knowing the media was going to be there. They, they opened their hearts to the court and they talked about the PTSD that they experienced. They talked about their own individual mental health issues that they've been dealing with since the date that they found out that Tristan was missing and then ultimately found out she had been killed. Uh, her brother um, spoke very openly, Tegan spoke very openly about some substance dependence and abuse that he developed trying to cope with the death of his sister. They talked about their anger. They spoke about their despair. They, they expressed the anxiety that they felt, the rage, the moments of just sheer rage that they experienced. Um, Tristan's father, uh, Forrest, told the court about the $33,000 that they have spent personally in counseling bills to try to get the family through this, um, this experience. He talked about paying Tristan Bailey's cell phone bill every month to this day because her friends and her family members still text Tristan. So he felt that it was inappropriate to cancel the phone line because all of these text messages keep coming through from Tristan's friends and family. Um, they spoke about the community support that they received. And, and I'm talking more than just, you know, the vigils and the momentary feelings of grief that, you know, that communities give because they feel bad for somebody at a particular moment. They talked about the community coming together. And because this was such a public trial and such a public event, the, the businesses in the, in the community actually had offered the Bailey family, I'll call them safe places. I'm not sure how else to explain the meaning. If they were in public and the, you know, the, the media or just people were, were starting to swarm the family members, various businesses allowed the Bailey family to be able to come into their business and basically hide out in the back room to kind of get away from the media and from the publicity and all of that what was going on at a particular moment. And that was something just obviously huge for a community to do for a family that has lost a loved one. Um, we all know that Tristan Bailey was very active in the cheer community and she had a tremendous impact on the lives of those cheerleaders and the families of those, those, uh, those athletes. But we also found out that other athletic uh, teams, other sports completely outside of cheer have already set up Tristan Bailey awards to honor Tristan Bailey's memory, uh, her strength and her leadership. So all of those things came out of things that this, the community have supported this family and what has happened to this family. Um, one of uh, Tristan's, old, actually Tristan's oldest sister, uh, Brittany, spoke about being, you know, on the floor, you know, in tears in her closet so many times and having to have her husband come in and her, her trying to avoid her, her young daughter. She's a three-year-old child too. 
from seeing all of this despair. So she would go and hide and cry in her closet. Just again, I, I don't mean to, 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 be, to belabor this point, but you just need to go listen to these um, to these victims' impact statements. They're they're truly amazing. Um, of what these people, the, the emotion these people put out into the public. You know, the family also talked to Aiden Fucci. Um, and some of the things that they said to Aiden Fucci um, was about his cowardly act. One of the statements was, you killed a five foot four inch, 13 year old girl. You know, how cowardly is that? You killed someone who trusted you. Uh, and again, I think that those were very strong and powerful words because they're directed right to Aiden Fucci's ego. We all know he wants to be a big shot. We've seen the way he acts. We've seen, you know, the, the videotapes of him, uh, you know, coming to court. We've heard the, the statements about him threatening guards and other inmates at the facility and how he wants to be a big shot. I think this statement hits home for him. You, you lured a five foot four inch, 13 year old girl into the woods and you murdered her. You didn't, you're not a big shot. You're not a big man. Uh, you're a coward. They did not accept Aiden Fucci's apologies. They said it's just not genuine. They're for self-serving purposes. Um, one of the comments I pulled out of their statements was, there's no goodness left in you, Aiden Fucci. You're, you have no human decency left. Um, Tristan's grandmother said some very powerful words, saying that a murderer is a thief who steals someone's future. And what he has done is he's stolen from this family and from Tristan, her ability to grow up and go to college and, you know, find love and get married and have children of, and a family of her own. All of those things were stolen from them as a family by Aiden Fucci. Tegan talked in depth about his position as a brother, you know, his, his, spot in the family as the brother. And he told Aiden Fucci that he is a failure as a brother because not only did he ruin his own life uh, by doing this, he has ruined the lives of his siblings uh, because this is a, something that they will have to live with and they will have to suffer with for the rest of their lives. Um, let's take a minute. I want to talk about all of the white stones that the family put in the jar. And again, the white stones symbolize their individual loss Alexis, again, put in a white stone representing the loss of trust in people um, that Aiden Fucci destroyed for her the day he chose to kill her sister. And I think those are very powerful, well-chosen words. He chose to kill her sister. This was an intentional act with premeditation. Again, one of the elements that the court needs to determine in order to issue a sentence in this case. Uh, Brittany, the oldest sister, put a white stone in for her the loss of her faith in the school system uh, because of all of the times that Aiden Fucci was given an opportunity by the school system. And what I think she feels is the school system letting her family down because someone should have identified the, the, the terrible thoughts and the terrible um, impulses that Aiden Fucci was suffering but didn't. Tegan, her brother's white stone, signifies um, the loss of the hope and belief in the goodness of people that died the day Aiden Fucci murdered his sister. Um, Stacy Bailey, Tristan's mom, the white stone was for the loss of her world, her future, and her beautiful daughter. Um, I get misty when I even say those words. She lost her whole world she lost her future and she has lost her daughter and her daughter's life. All of the things that she would have and should have had the opportunity to experience are gone. Stacy also put a white stone in for Tristan's older, but just immediately older sister, uh, Sophia, uh, who's still a minor, so she did not speak uh, in public. Uh, she lost the opportunity to be a big sister uh, to Tristan. And that was, again, something that was done for Sophia on Sophia's behalf by her mom. Forrest Bailey, the father, um, says that his white stone is for the loss to the Bailey family and to the world. Because Tristan was such a, a, a ray of light 
to this community, to her friends, to the people around her. She meant so much to everyone that the world has lost a, um, a valuable member because of this heinous crime. Jean Sheffield, I believe her name is Jean. I'm not sure if she's, it's Jane or Jean, so I apologize if I've gotten her name wrong. She spoke uh, on behalf of herself and the other grandparents, and I thought that was very uh, respectful to the court to have one grandparent speak on behalf of all the grandparents. She actually read the victim impact statements of the other grandparents to the court and her own. And their white stone is for the loss of their happiness, for the loss of their grandchild. So again, enormously powerful representation by the family. After the family had a chance to give their victims impact statements, they chose Gia Bauer, Tristan's best friend, to come and speak to the court on behalf of the children's perspective, of her friend's perspective. Understand now, Gia is 15 years old and she is a, um, she was Tristan's best friend. So there is audio of her statements, but I could not find good audio and video to, to put on here. If I do find it, if I do identify it, I will try to put it on here for you. But again, they don't actually put her face on the camera. You know, in, in Florida, minors that are not, obviously the defendants in the case are not uh, videotaped. They're not shown in uh, court proceedings, they do the same thing with juries. They try to keep the sanctity of that, um, of, of those witnesses and those people uh, sacred. So they kind of keep them out of the press. So she's a 15 year old Korean girl who talked about how she and Tristan were Asian sisters together because Tristan was born in Singapore. So they had that Asian connection together. She spoke about how the person that she would go to in difficult times, the person she would confide in, the person that she would go to when she was down was Tristan. But now with this loss, she can't go to anybody else because the person that she trusted and the person that she loved most and would speak to something of this nature was Tristan. And she's gone and she cannot share this grief with anyone. Um, understand that she's a 15-year-old girl. And, and I think this is very uh, again, a metaphor that, that's very telling. She had to change her Starbucks order because she and Tristan, when they went to Starbucks, they would order, I, I think it's a chocolate chip frappuccino together. And because that was her and Tristan's order, she can't order that anymore. She can't go to, to Starbucks and get that drink because the rush of emotion, the rush of, of, of just depression and, and I guess the tears that come to her eye happen every time she says that drink. So she can't even ever drink that anymore. She talked about missing the opportunities to grow up with Tristan, to be her bridesmaid or for them to be bridesmaid at each other's weddings, to have their children together and to have those children grow up together. She also got an opportunity to put a white stone into the jar. Um, Gia Bauer's white stone was the loss of her innocence. And again, sorry, I get a little misty about this because how powerful is that for a 15 year old girl you know, to get up in front of all these people and, and share that emotion with the court. I mean, <laughs> well, well presented Bailey family. I, I cannot, uh, I cannot give you more applause. All right, let's um, let's switch gears for a second. That was the extent of the Bailey's family representation. Uh, the defense then started their presentation, and again, they have an opportunity to provide to the court uh, any evidence that they believe is necessary and relevant for the judge to be able to consider it in sentencing Aiden Fucci. So one of the people that they put up was a person by the name of Raul Esbanco, I believe is the way you say his name. Uh, he's a prison consultant. So he talked about a day in the life of an inmate in jail. So he talked about how you get up at 4.30 in the morning, you undergo numerous counts in the jail, you're limited in the time that you have to complete tasks and eat meals, and your day is basically regimented every moment of every day from the moment you wake up until the moment that there's a lights out at the jail. And that's just the way life is going to be for Aiden Fucci at the, uh, you know, in prison. And it is not going to be um, something that is easy. It is not going to be something that he's going to enjoy. Uh, it's probably going to be very difficult for him is what he said. I think the reason they put him on the stand though, was to talk about the available programs for juvenile inmates at the Department of Corrections. The Department of Corrections obviously has educational, vocational, and other types of rehabilitative programs. 
And he testified that these programs are divvied out to inmates based on their eligibility. So what they were hoping for is for the judge to take this into consideration and not give Aiden Fuji a life sentence because they want a sentence of 40 years, which is a term of years. And that term of years, uh, he claims, is important because if he has a term of years, he has a much better chance of getting rehabilitative programs and vocational programs because when he's if he were to get a life sentence, then that life sentence means that he would be basically passed off to other inmates, other juveniles that have a, a sentence that's going to come to a fruition date. So they will provide those people education, vocational, rehabilitative, re-entry into society programs to help them re-enter into normal society when they're released from prison. Uh, they talk generally about the safety and the housing. There are two youth offender or youth prisons in Florida. One is uh, Lake City. It's the youthful offender facility here in Florida. There is another one. It's in Swanee. It is the maximum security male inmate facility uh, where pretty much you are in supermax for little kids. He talked about how, you know, Aiden is going to be in a very rough um, group of people. These are all violent offenders. These are all hardened criminals. So, you know, his safety is going to probably be something that is taken into consideration by the Bureau of Prisons more so than a, another inmate, not to say that they don't take those other inmates seriously, but more so because of the public nature of this particular crime and the press that it's received. He's probably going to wind up going to Swanee and being in the maximum security facility in a cell all by himself most of the time. So that was the extent of that testimony. The defense also called a gentleman by the name of Dwayne Martin. Dwayne Martin is a counselor with the Department of Juvenile Justice. Apparently, he was Aiden Fucci's uh, DJJ counselor and would come and see Aiden Fucci on a regular interval at the jail. He reported that he had talked to Aiden Fucci and he knew that Aiden Fucci reported hearing voices and he had reported this multiple times over the course of his interactions with Aiden Fucci, when I think he goes and sees him monthly or whatever his his uh, uh, his schedule is. He talked about how Aiden Fucci's medications had been changed over the course of time. He's actually obviously medicated now, which is why he is, frankly, I think far more docile than we were used to seeing him in videotapes and in the earlier um, you know, uh, court hearings. And generally, he said he was respectful to him and there were no problems. He didn't have any issues with him personally. On cross-examination, the, uh, the state came back. I just wanted to make sure about his experience with Aiden Fucci regarding his representation of how mature Aiden Fucci was. Now, this is important because maturity is one of the elements that the court has to take into consideration. Uh, Dwayne Martin pretty much said that Aiden Fucci was mature for his age. And he was, you know, able to communicate with him, um, and there was no, you know, no problems that he had being able to, you know, get Aiden Fuchs to understand what was going on. The communication was fine. So, between you and me, a little bit of a, of um, I think of a, of a implosion on that particular witness. It, it didn't really do Aiden Fuchs any good because I think the cross examination question is: Is he mature? Yes, he is. He's mature for his age really, you know, tick the box for the judge. The rest of the information about hearing voice cell talk, we knew about that. We'd seen that videotapes from Aiden Fucci being at the jail. It, it's something that had been uh, brought up before. There was no motion ever filed by the defense saying that he's insane or that there is something about his uh, mental state that precludes him from being able to go forward or to know right from wrong or to be able to assist his lawyers in, um, in, you know, aiding them in the defense. So again, words, um, you know, but not really much substance, not to blame Mr. Martin, not much substance for the defense uh, in that particular testimony that was good for them. Let's, um, let's switch gears for a second and let's talk about Debbie Wyrick. Debbie Wyrick is Aiden Fucci's maternal grandmother. Um, this woman is a very brave lady. Understand that she got up in front of the cameras and everybody in court. And her son is, excuse me, her grandson is the, and I put this in quotes, the monster. Her grandson is the one that murdered, you know, the light of this community, Tristan Bailey. So I give her, again, I, I can't blame her for being his family member. You know, it, it's not her fault, uh, but she 
came to speak on behalf of her loved one. And what she did is she, tr she brought a letter with her. She brought uh, something written and she tried to read the letter, but she just wasn't able to do it. She apologized to the court. She apologized to everyone. She just could not bring herself to actually read the words that she had written on, uh, on those papers. But what she did is she told the court that Aiden has five siblings. Aiden is the, the middle child that he had a good mother and he had a good father and she never ex witnessed him ever being mean to the animals that were in her home or that were in Aiden's home. Um, she did express that the children of the Fuji household often talked about their house being haunted. So that was, I think, kind of, again, odd to put that in there, but th she did say that she spoke to the Bailey family. And I, and I did put a picture up here of the Bailey family's reaction. Again, talk about a class act from the Baileys. They just listened um, to Miss Wyrick and just let her speak and they were not rude. They were not loud. They were not disrespectful. In fact, I could see it. And, and this was the picture that I, I think I, I took that summons as best. Again, this is Tristan's oldest sister. You can see the emotion in her face as she's listening to Aiden's grandmother. Talk about how she prays for the Bailey family every day. And she prays for her family and for Aiden because they're a good Christian family and they recognize that how big of a tragedy this is and how Aiden Fucci is going to be punished for this crime. Um, she did write a letter to the family expressing her sadness for the loss of their child. Um, this is the first time that Aiden Fucci showed emotion during this sentencing. The Bailey family spoke and I did not see the cameras pan onto Aiden Fucci at a time where he expressed any emotion. But when his grandmother did, when his grandmother spoke, this is the, the photo I, I grabbed from a screenshot uh, while watching this live. And it's Aiden obviously he's cleaning out his eyes. He obviously got teary eyed for a moment for his grandmother, for her ob obligation to have to speak to this, uh, you know, to the court about this. All right. Um, later, I found out that Aiden Fucci had instructed his parents to not come to court. Uh, apparently, there had been threats against the Fucci family. Uh, the Fucci family had to move from their home, so they actually had to leave their home. I understand his biological father has lost his business. There were rumors, and again, I, I didn't, I cannot confirm this. I didn't look to confirm it that his stepfather may have lost his job because all of this. Um, so take that for what it's worth. That's why you did not see. Um, Aiden Fucci's mother, father, stepfather come and speak. Apparently he asked them not to show up. I got this question from one of our viewers uh, in the day one videotape. And we talked generally about could Aiden Fucci's mother have spoken in court? The answer is yes. Even though she sub subjects herself to perjury by getting on the stand, but she still has criminal charges pending. I don't know if the state would have taken it upon themselves to try to use that moment to you know, further the prosecution of her tampering with witness case. I, I think if she wanted to speak to the judge, they would have just let her read a victim's impact statement. I wouldn't, I don't think they would have gone any further than that with it. But anyway, she did not speak. Um, and she could have done that, could, could have done it if she wanted to. Um, probably a good thing she did not And I think the way that the family, the Fuji family dealt with is probably the better way to do it. You know, looking in hindsight, the mother uh, Aiden's mother did write a letter to the judge asking for leniency. So that is something that the court did receive from her. Um, Cross-examination from the state was frankly kind of some softballs. And the, the question they asked were, did she have any mental, uh, uh, in, uh, some mental illness in her family? She said no. Um, did she know of any abuse that Aiden Fucci suffered at the hands of his parents? She said no. Did she ever uh, hear Aiden Fucci complain of hearing voices? She said no. And again, these were questions specifically derived from the elements necessary for the court to make a finding uh, for sentencing purposes. So she just kind of hit those, uh, the prosecutor hit those um, quickly just to get that out of the way. So the court knows there is no history of these things. So you kind of check the boxes and go on. 
A um, couple of lay witnesses. There were some teachers. Uh, Allison uh, Dubalty is, I think, her name. She's a teacher and a school administrator. And uh, Dean Wet Wetchin. Uh, I call him Dean not because it's his first name. I think his first name is Chris, but he is the dean of students at the school. Generally, their testimonies were um, Aiden Fuji had no cognitive disability. He was a respectful kid. He worked well with others. They never saw him violent, although they admitted he had a temper. Apparently one time, uh, and Dean Wetchin testified to this, Aiden threatened to throw a female student out of a window. So I, me personally, I consider that as violence, but I guess I get their point. They never actually saw him engage in a fist fight or something like that in school. Uh, the Dean said that, um, you know, he always had an open door because of the, um, you know, the special needs that Aiden uh, had. So he could always go see Dean Wetchin whenever he wanted to and talk through problems. And he said the one thing that did impact him was Aiden did have his younger sister at school with him. Aiden was in middle school. Obviously, the younger sister was in elementary school. And because of the way that car line works at this particular school, if the parents are picking up a child from middle school and a child from elementary school, the elementary school children go with their middle school siblings to go uh, get picked up in one place. And he said that he often saw Aiden holding his little sister's hand. Uh, and he just felt that that was something that was important for the court to know. Uh, and that was about the extent of the um, of the questioning. There was cross-examination, but I'll be honest, it was again, more of the elements necessary to check the boxes for the court. Uh, nothing really that we haven't already talked about before. Final witness for, uh, for the defense. Uh, was a expert witness, Stephen Bloomfield is his name, and he is a psychologist. He worked for the defense. And his testimony basically was, your frontal cortex, which is the part of your brain that makes your decision-making for you, does not fully develop until you're in your 20s, um, clearly not developed in a 14-year-old boy. And 14-year-old boys apparently have heightened risk, uh, which is meaning that they do dumb things because that increased risk increases the dopamine that the brain releases, which is the feel good uh, hormone. And that's why boys do dangerous things because it makes them uh, happy. So now we all know why boys do dumb stuff when they're young. It's because our brains aren't developed and we like to do dangerous things because it makes it makes us feel good because we think we're cool. So that's pretty much what he testified to. Uh, he does believe that Aiden Fucci, as his brain develops, the older that he gets, he will become amenable to rehabilitation and will be uh, reformable in his future years. This particular doctor indicates that he did find that there is a history of mental illness in the Fucci family. Apparently his uncle was Baker acted when he was about 14 years old also. Uh, he has a grandfather apparently who had some severe mental illness and depression issues that he dealt with all of his life. Um, they did talk about the school records and he went and reviewed the school records and his recommendation was that if he would have been the school counselor and saw Aiden Fucci's school records, he would have recommended counseling. And even though the school system didn't have the ability to identify uh, Aiden's uh, mental health issues, they were not able to serve Aiden Fucci's needs. A little self-serving in my opinion, but take it for what it is. Next, uh, his comments about Aiden Fucci's maturity kind of um, kind of got me wrapped in a loop. Let me just tell you what he said. He said that Aiden acts immaturely because he killed a child. That is an immature act. Uh, but he doesn't know if Aiden Fucci's actions were premeditated because we're not inside of Aiden Fucci's head. So we don't know what he was thinking. I don't know if I agree with that because the courts allow for the ability of the court to take into consideration circumstantial evidence. We do it in our daily lives. For example, if I'm not outside and you walk inside and you're wet and you're holding an umbrella, I can presume from the circumstances that it's raining outside. So that is something that we can take into consideration. And I think this part of the, uh, the, the, the doctor's testimony kind of fell flat because I think it would have been better off to say that he is a 14 year old boy. Therefore he is not mature. And, and I'll tell you, there was some discussion in cross-examination about what is maturity, you know, mature from what perspective, you know, uh, but 
yeah, everybody else seems to think that Aiden Fucci is fine, if not mature for his age, at least on par with his age. I think we can tell that Aiden Fucci's actions are premeditated because he told his friends that he wanted to kill someone. He wanted to feel what it was like to watch the blood pour out of somebody and watch the life leave them. He uh, drew pictures of stabbings. He, uh, I mean, he, he, there's enough here to, to show that this was not an act that happened kind of uh, in the spur of the moment, in the heat of the moment. It was something that Aiden Fucci clearly planned uh, to do. Now, didn't plan well because he's a 14 year old boy and he doesn't really understand how to, you know, to commit a crime like this and get away with it because he's 14, but still premeditation nonetheless. So again, I'm just adding my 10 cents to that, but the, prof uh, I keep calling professor, I apologize. Dr. Bloomfield's representation is that, you know, these actions, we will never know if they were premeditated. His prognosis was that Aiden Fucci is an excellent candidate for rehabilitation. Okay. Um, take it for what you will. There was a lot of banter between the prosecutor and um, a lot of banter between the prosecutor and um, uh, Dr. Bloomfield about his testimony. And the banter pretty much stayed in the topic of, let's get some definitions clear here, Doc. Um, what is the definition of a learning disability? You know, what are, let's talk about the school records that show that he's suspended. He's been thrown out of school before. Let's talk about the definition of impetuousness, you know, which obviously Aiden Fucci is impetuous. He's a 14 year old boy that killed somebody, obviously. But impetuous from a legal definition is is this something that was just, could he did it because he just couldn't control himself or something that he planned out? And I think that the the fight back and forth between the expert and the, uh, and the prosecutor really hit home that we're just kind of, you know, running in circles, trying to mince words about what Aiden Fucci's maturity level is and what Aiden Fucci's ability to premeditate is. He pled to first degree murder, ladies and gentlemen. So at this point, there's no question about his ability to make decisions for himself or they wouldn't have accepted the guilty plea. Um, yes, he was taking ADHD medication. A lot of people take ADHD medication and don't kill people. So again, um, I believe that the this particular expert, you know, even though you have to have a contrary expert, so I don't blame the defense. They had to do it. I don't think it was as effective of a representation as the state's expert witness the day before. Other than that, let's talk about what else happened. Um, let me get lost here. Okay, what else happened is this: the defendants also sent letters to the court. I believe Aiden Fucci's family members' letters are about 30 in total, uh, as opposed to the 130 letters from friends and family on the Bailey side. So, I mean, again, it is what it is, 30 letters. The court did take that into consideration. He did indicate that he has received those letters. Let's talk about the judge for a second. This is Judge Smith. And one of the things that he did prior to allowing the lawyers to do their closing statements was he spoke to Mr. Fucci directly. And what he said to Aiden Fucci is, are you satisfied with the presentations given by your lawyers? Yes. Is there anything else that you want your lawyers to present to this court for its consideration before we close the evidentiary purpose? No. Is there anything else that is relevant to this court's determination that you want to put in the record? His lawyer actually piped up and said they would be filing some stuff that night. Fine. Okay. I'll make sure that that gets taken into consideration. Is there anything else, Mr. Fucci, that you want me to know? No. Why are these questions important? Understand that the law is a process and due process is afforded at this point to Aiden Fucci. He is the star of this show. Everything has to be done to protect him. He is the defendant. Even though he's pled guilty to a crime, he still has the right to a fair sentence. So the court wants to make sure that Aiden Fucci is satisfied with what's going on because we have a, a rule here in Florida. It's rule 3.850. And what it says is if there is something that your lawyers should have done or if there's something that your lawyers did that caused you a problem as a defendant, you have the right to come back and ask for a new trial 
because it's ineffective assistance of your counsel. And that is, you know, it's a constitutional protection, your, you know, the right to counsel. So the judge asked him these questions to make sure for purposes of future appeals that Aiden Fucci most likely will file because he has to file them because this is, again, the process. Um, he wants to make sure that it's clear for the record that there's nothing else that Aiden Fucci wanted to present. Now, there are no additional witnesses, no additional documents, no additional evidence at all, and that he is satisfied with the representation he's receiving from these lawyers. So that's why the judge asks those questions. Uh, it is not just of Aiden Fucci. This is a question that gets asked of, uh, of defendants all the time in court. So very normal. All right, closing arguments. Uh, the state's attorney did the closing arguments and basically I think did a wonderful job of just kind of keeping it simple. There are elements that the court needs to find. We've talked about them. There's elements in Rule of Criminal Procedure 3.781 if you're interested to go find it. There are elements in the Florida Statute 921.9401. I'll say that again. 921.9401 is the Florida Statute that talks about what this court needs to evaluate in order to come to a decision about what the sentence should be. And what the prosecutor did is she kind of went through most, you know, not everyone, but most of the elements right down the line, the nature and circumstances of the crime, the effect of the crime in the to the victim's family and the community, Fucci's acceptance of responsibility, Fucci's background, you know, his criminal history, the effect of, you know, um, these proceedings on the defendant. And I kind of go down the line, you know, is he rehabilitatable? And she asks the court to um, give Aiden Fucci a life sentence. Um, and, and I think she was just very matter of fact. It was a very clean presentation, uh, reiterated some of the strong points necessary uh, for the court to be able to check the box for a sentence of life. I give this lady a lot of credit. This is Aiden Fucci's defense counsel. Uh, let's be real, guys. It's not easy being a public defender. It is not easy being a criminal defense lawyer sometimes. You represent the bad guy. Let's be real. And especially in a case like this. But she still has to do her job. She has to keep the emotion out of her decision making. She has to keep her wits about her. She needs to be professional. She needs to be respectful. But at the same time, she has to ask the questions that are necessary to do the best job that she can for Aiden Fucci. It is her obligation. It is her oath to the Florida bar. So I think she's done a great job with the cards that she's been dealt. There's only so much she can put up there because there's not much really there to help her clients. So what does she do? I think she did a very elegant presentation. That elegant presentation focused on the elements that she could affect. She didn't talk about stuff she knew she was going to lose. She didn't go out there and just make the judge be like, what are you doing? What are you saying right now? She focused on stuff that she believed could have an impact. And let's talk about what she said. Aiden Fucci accepted responsibility and spared this family, uh, the community, and the court from having to try this case. Check mark in Aiden Fucci's court. He does not have a criminal history. It's one of the elements the court has to consider. The criminal history is nothing. Check mark, Aiden Fucci. There is a family background of mental illness. Whether or not um, you know the state's expert thinks it has an effect on Aiden Fucci, the question is, is it there? And the answer that she said is, it is there. And it, she was very good about saying it. Like you know, she had an uncle that was Baker active at 14 years of age because he was the same age as Aiden Fucci was when he committed this crime. There is something in his history that exists that the court has to take into consideration. Uh, she spoke about the effects of a child going to prison. Yes, we all look at Aiden Fucci as a monster, and he's 16 years old now, but he is a child compared to the other folks that are going to be in these very, very maximum security type prisons that he's going to go to. Um, he is not going to be the, the, the big shot there, I promise you that. Uh, he, excuse me, she asked for the court to consider a term of years so that Aiden Fucci can get the rehabilitative services in the state prison that he needs to help him kind of transition into a better human being. That's kind of the big deal here is a term of years, he gets some treatment, a life sentence, he won't for a long time. And I wanted to say 
Aiden Fucci, no matter what the sentence is, is coming back in 25 years to have his sentence reevaluated, no matter what. So this is going to be reconsidered at some point. So I, I am not certain if really this fight that we're having about 40 years, which would mean Aiden Fucci would be 50, what, 56? Is that right? Uh, what, 25 years plus 16? Oh, gosh, what am I saying? 60 years old by the time he gets out of prison uh, on, the, on a good day uh, versus a life sentence. All that's going to be taken into consideration, you know, 25 years from now when he is, you know, what, 40 years old. That's when the discussion is going to get made whether or not his sentence should be changed. That's a long time from now. I don't know if a lot of this honestly makes much of a difference practically because in 25 years when Aiden Fucci comes back, regardless of the sentence, they're going to be asking all these exact same questions all over again and asking again for the court to give him a term of years so that he can get rehabilitative services. Okay. So that's what's going to happen regardless. All right. Sentencing uh, did in fact happen today. And I want to talk to you about what the sentencing proceedings looked like. Um, here's our judge again, Judge Smith. Judge Smith is a very even killed guy. I don't know him personally. He's been a uh, been practicing law for about 16 years. So you know, not new to law, not new to the bench. He came on this morning and he said that he had uh, reviewed portions of about 200 pages of deposition transcript. He had read 150 letters in total, like I said, about 130, which were from the Bailey side and about you know, 120, excuse me, the Bailey side, and about 30 letters from the defense. Um, he asked, and again, he's doing a great job of keeping the procedure in line, in check for the court file. It's the job of the judge to kind of keep the court record clear. And he wanted to make sure from the defense team, can the court find that Aiden Fucci killed Tristan Bailey? Because that is one of the elements necessary to prove this offense and is an element that has to be found by the jury. But there was no jury trial because Aiden Fucci pled guilty. And he just wanted to know, can the defense, can he find that by stipulation? Meaning, will the defense just agree that because they filed a guilty plea and changed the plea from not guilty to guilty, that Aiden Fucci admits to killing Tristan Bailey? The defense did say, yes, that is a stipulation they can make. So the court's like, fine, you guys agree to that. So check that box. They agree that the sentence can be between 40 years and life. Yes, everybody agrees. And then the court changed gears. And what Judge Smith did was he kind of shifted over to speak to the Bailey family. And he talked to them and he said, no matter what the sentence is going to be, this is not going to heal um, their family. A sentence is not going to provide closure. He told them that, you know, they need to allow Tristan's spirit to be free and they need to let her spirit fill the voids in their hearts that they feel. They need to continue Bailey Family Sunday in order to commemorate her uh, and to remember her and to you know, become a family again. Because even though her body is no longer with us, her spirit is with her family all the time. He spoke directly to Tristan's father and he told uh, Mr. Bailey, that the court understands that justice moves slowly. Uh, there are procedural safeguards in place to protect the defendant and to protect the sanctity of the process of the criminal justice system. Um, and in that process, the lawyers have to work to make sure that things get done right and that things get done right the first time. So we don't have to keep hashing these cases out. Um, the court was very... Um, complimentary to the lawyers, both the defense and the prosecution. These are difficult jobs, they're difficult cases. And he, he recognized that they, they obviously worked honorably to do their jobs. I think this was important for the judge to do because he wanted to let everybody listening that don't be mad at the defense lawyers. They're doing a job. It is their obligation to aid in Fucci. If you were on the stand, you would want your lawyers to do that exact same level of diligent work that they did for Aiden Fucci. So again, I think that was, was a wise word for the judge to just put out there in the public realm so that nobody's targeting these defense lawyers. Like you, you, you dirty defense lawyers, you defended this guy. It is their obligation. 
It is their ethical duty to do what they did. So let's just put that out there. So after that, Judge Smith went through all the 921.9401 factors, maturity. He agrees that Aiden Fucci's brain is not fully developed and it's not going to be a fully developed until he's in his 20s. He agrees that Aiden Fucci is of average maturity for his age. He recognizes that Aiden Fucci had a learning disability present, but there were resources in place that allowed him the ability to work through those uh, disabilities. He spoke about Aiden Fucci's background. He found that Aiden Fucci had a very normal home environment. He found that the parents were involved in Aiden Fucci's life. Um, he, the judge also had to make a decision about the extent of the participation of Aiden Fucci in this offense. Again, one of the elements. He found that Aiden Fucci was 100% responsible. No one else but Aiden Fucci was responsible for this crime. Um, he found that there was no peer pressure or no familial pressure for Aiden Fucci to commit this crime. He confirmed that he recognizes that Aiden Fucci has no criminal history and he is not going to consider, this is important for appellate purposes, he wanted the appellate court to know he is not taking into consideration any of Aiden Fucci's prior bad acts, not the conduct in the jail, not any fistfight that he may have been part of as a kid, none of that to enhance his sentence. He recognizes that there is prior bad act history, but he is not using it to enhance Aiden Fucci at all. So criminal history, zero. Next element, rehabilitation. He believes, meaning the judge, believes that Aiden Fucci has shown the ability to modify his behavior. Um, he has shown it through uh, being a student. Uh, he's kind of shown it through his progressing in the court system through this case. But Judge Smith said that he finds that this crime is extraordinary. And he truly believes that Aiden Fucci's prognosis for rehabilitation is poor. Uh, backtrack, Judge Smith backtracked a little bit and talked about the effect of the crime on the family and the community. And he said, by no means, this was a significant crime. There is no greater loss than the loss of a child. Um, all of the victim's impact statements that he read were compelling. He believes that the community, the St. John's community where he grew up in, he has been a lawyer in and he is now a judge in, has been materially changed. He knows of the letters he wrote that children could not sleep alone. They were sleeping in bed with their parents out of fear of being killed during the time that, you know, Aiden, uh, I'm sorry, during the time that Tristan Bailey was missing and they weren't unsure what had happened after she was found murdered. He also recognized that the community's mental health resources in St. John's County were completely exhausted. He said that Obviously, the mental health counselors that are in the community did the best they could, and they did a wonderful and valiant job, but there, were more, there was more need than the resources that the community could provide. And he recognized that that was an issue because so many people in the community were seeking mental health counseling and grief counseling and those types of things after this event. He said it was the worst case he has ever seen in St. John's County, and that says a lot. Recognizing, guys, St. John's County is one county south of... Um, Duval County, which is Jacksonville, which is actually technically the biggest county in the country by uh, by um, by acreage, by size, uh, by area. But St. John's County is a small county. They have a they have one felony courtroom in this particular county, which is really small. So from his perspective, worst case ever. He believes. Let me kind of continue in the, his uh, consideration of the proper sentence that. Um, Aiden Fucci was impetuous, but he did understand the risk of his conduct. He understood the nature of what he was doing. All right, next element, the nature and circumstances of the crime um, and the effect of the, on the defendant. These he kind of dealt with together. And here's what he says. He finds that Aiden Fucci stabbed Tristan Bailey 114 times. He says these autopsy photos were particularly difficult to review and to, to consider. He knew that Tristan was conscious and aware of her attack and she tried to fend it off. He knew that she underwent a tremendous amount of pain um, during her attack. 
He believes that there was a heightened level of premeditation. He says only 1% of juvenile cases in his circuit um, uh, are homicides. And this one was an absolute outlier. And he finds that the circumstances of this offense were shocking to the conscious. Um, he found Aiden Fucci absolutely understood his actions. He attempted to cover up the crime. He was premeditated in luring a young girl who trusted him into the woods, into a place of darkness where he killed her. He attempted to conceal the evidence by trying to hide his clothes and sneaking back into his house and taking a shower. Uh, by the text messages that he sent, has anybody seen Tristan? Which between you and me, I don't think was him trying to hide. I think that was a polite way of saying he was trying to show off that you're never going to catch me. That's what I think Aiden Fucci was doing, but I digress. Uh, and in the videos uh, that were shown to the court for sentencing, he attempted to conceal the crime. And some big words from Judge Smith. He found that this crime had no motive. There was no heat of passion. Tristan had not slighted Aiden Fucci. There was no feelings of uh, animosity. She hadn't hurt him. She hadn't made fun of him. She hadn't done anything to him but try to be his friend. Um, no motive for this crime, just a heinous act. So with that, the judge very systematically pronounced a sentence, and here's what it is. He adjudicates Aiden Fucci guilty to premeditated first-degree murder. He sentences him to life in prison with a review in 25 years. He ordered the Department of Corrections to notify Aiden Fucci when he is eligible to apply for reconsideration. He assessed the standard fines and he told Aiden Fucci he's got 30 days to appeal. That was it. Done. He adjourned the case. And ladies and gentlemen, that's all there is. What do I think is going to happen now? I think we're going to see a notice of appeal filed within the next 30 days. Uh, it's very normal. They're not going to appeal the conviction and the at all. What they're going to do is appeal the sentence, and they're going to argue that the judge should have found 40 years or should have made a decision about a term of years as opposed to a life sentence. And for all the reasons that are in their briefs that we'll see, I'm sure, in the next six months to a year, Aiden Fucci is now going to be released from the county jail and sent to the Florida uh, Department of Corrections, at which point he'll be taken to Swanee, is my, my guess. He's going to be dealt with there. Um, so at this point, guys, that's really all there is to say. Leave me your questions below. Uh, give me your comments. I know you guys have been really great uh, over the last couple of episodes of talking about your emotions and what you felt about all of this. Watch the Bailey family videos. Tell me what you think. I, I can't do them justice. I'm not even going to try but you've got to see them. This family is probably the most amazingly uh, collected group of people speaking about the violent murder of their loved one that I think I've seen uh, ever. So with that, thank you for joining us. Uh, questions and comments below, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching another episode of The Lawyer You Know. If you enjoyed the episode, please hit the thumbs up and share with your friends who may be interested here on YouTube. And don't forget to subscribe. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok at Tragos Law is our handle. And don't forget to listen to The Lawyer You Know podcast featuring new episodes every week. If you have a case you want to talk to us about, if it's a personal injury case, wrongful death, catastrophic injury, car accident, or slip and fall case, please email us at lawyeryouknow at gmail.com. And of course, all these links I just mentioned are included in the description below on this episode and every episode. So until next time, this is Peter Tragos, the lawyer you know.